Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Bible Discoveries, the weekend show. So on this show, if this is your first time here, we're reading through the Bible, the entire Bible, this year with Bible Discovery and Bible Discovery TV. And so on this show, we discuss big issues that pop up as we're reading through the Bible. And we also aim to answer or at least discuss some of your questions as well that we get from the comment section of our videos and also from emails that you send to the ministry and to us directly. So thank you so much for doing that to everyone who has contributed. It's really, really fun to develop this community and be able to talk back and forth, uh, even if it is just via text in the comment section. It's still really good. So again, if this is your first time here, my name is Corey and I'm joined uh, by my husband, Matlock. Hey, Matlock. Hey, what's going on? Yeah. You know, the show. The show. Yeah, the show's the back show. on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One more week. Per Peruge. Peruge. Yeah, That's right. All right. So if you're uh, following along and reading your Bible uh, every day, which you should be, if not, please do, uh, you're supposed to read this week Joshua 5 to Judges 3, which is... Some the, rough reading. Rough reading, the rough conquest. Reading it's interesting. Either it way, is. but we actually don't have that many questions pertaining to the conquest. Mm -hmm. You know, your typical Surprisingly, questions. Surprisingly, yeah. How could God be so evil with the genocide? All these questions that we don't have. Yeah, The not questions today, are anyway. actually... I'm shocked by the questions because they're so just like... They're different. They're just different. I like yeah. that, though. Yeah. It's good to be shocked by... The variety of questions that you right. receive sometimes. I'm, it's refreshing. Yes. I'm kind of afraid that the show is going to be five minutes long. No. We'll see, though. We'll see. I mean, <laughs> I guess so. We will see. Okay. Yeah, I'm going right. to ask you the first question, okay, though. Okay, sure. Then. All right? Let's go. Okay. So, Matt Locke. Yeah. This is a question from Matt. Uh, and he says, Jehovah Witnesses teach Jesus is an angel. Christians teach Jesus is God. But Christians also teach that Jesus uh, is a pre-incarnate angel. Is Jesus an angel or God? Which is it? All right. And I see it's in relation to Joshua 5, and I'm assuming that that was chosen because the commander of the Lord's army. Right. Okay. Who comes and speaks to Joshua. That's right. And allows Joshua to bow down, right? That's right. Big deal. Um, so but just quickly, just to say right off the cuff before I read this part, um, is that... An angel isn't like a genus or like a species. An angel just simply means messenger. So in the New Testament, John is referred to angelos, which is in Greek means angel. He's referred to as an angel in John the ba sorry, John the Baptist. And uh, we know he's not an actual like he doesn't have wings or anything. He's like not that. a spiritual being. In yeah, terms that's of, yeah. exactly. Yeah, exactly. It so, goes between heaven and earth. But it means angel, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it means spiritual. Angel means uh, messenger. So, so it would be that like the context then that determines whether or not you're talking about like a spiritual being or whether you're talking about a human interacting, like acting as yeah. a messenger. So, for instance, another instance would be when Jesus refers to the angels. Right. Which refers to the heavenly hosts and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So the term can be used in multiple ways, just like most words can be used in multiple right. ways, right? So it's talking so about the heavenly messengers. And then there's also earthly messengers. And so the term can just, the term is pretty basic. It just means messengers. It just mm -hmm. depends how it's used. You're saying the context and stuff. So that's the first thing. So can Jesus, can Jesus be an angel and God? Like, well, yeah, because God could be a messenger. So, right. <laughs> right. So that's the first thing. So angels are not a species of some kind. Fair enough. So that's important. I think that's what gets people confused because um, Jehovah Witnesses do teach that Jesus is the archangel Michael. Right. That he's just, and he, that he's a creature. And that he's not God. Mm -hmm. um, and that's false. It's just plainly false. Like it's uh, throughout all of scripture. Only God can be worshipped. Then Jesus is worshipped frequently. Mm -hmm. um, and he accepts worship frequently. And we talk about this all the time. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so that the explicit answer to this question is, is Jesus an angel or God? It's okay, well, it can be both because angel isn't a species. Right. It just means messenger. Right. So, so, but Jesus is God. But he's not like a created creature. Angel. It, and that's it's, all that it's an interesting distinction, though, because yeah. I, I think you're right in drawing out that culturally we tend to think about angels as a species. Yes. We send, tend to think, about, oh, that means those creatures that live in heaven and they're sent to earth to bring messages and they go back and forth and they have different purposes in the scripture. Like we know some of them worship around the throne, some of them guard the throne of God. Like cherubim are, are more like seen as kind of guardian spiritual right. beings. So we tend to think angels immediately we go to that, but it is important uh, to to remember that just because we've built that under cultural understanding of it, biblically, the biblical understanding of it right. is it's a role That's right. that can be filled by 
humans. It can be filled by Jesus, who is both man and God. It can be filled by spiritual beings, sons of God, right. however you want to, a host of heaven, yeah, however sure. you want to categorize And that. so like for instance, even cherubim, right, is uh, not necessarily a, like a type of angel, quote unquote. Sure. Uh, it's a, a type of heavenly host. It's a guardian angel, mm -hmm. but doesn't say anything about like what the angel's anatomy is mm -hmm. and what the guardian or do you see what i'm saying it's yeah just and guardian. we do get some really interesting descriptions in ezekiel yes, of cherubim do. and right. like wild things yeah and seraphim yeah. have the closest thing to anatomy that we that we mm -hmm. documented which is just uh flying fiery uh, celestial serpents yeah so it's like that's the closest thing that we have to uh, you know it being tied to anatomy but maybe not necessarily so right, right? so it, either way the point here is just we say is i think that answers the question is it is just an angel or is he God? Well, he's God. That can also be a messenger. Uh, besides that, so why are we reading this at, at Joshua 5? Mm -hmm. Well, there's something really interesting here. Uh, when Joshua, I'm going to read Joshua uh, chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him and his dr uh, drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? And he said, no, but I am the commander of the, of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his feet to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Okay. Why this is important is that there's a, a person here who is in human form, who's standing at Joshua. Joshua worships before him, calls him Lord, right? The angel accepts the worship, and the angel, right, says, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. What does that sound like? <laughs> okay? Yeah. All right? A, it sounds like pre-incarnate Christ. Yeah. Right? It also sounds like the angel of the Lord in the burning bush yep. in Exodus, Exodus 3. So, and, and remember that the it, when God speaks to Moses in the burning bush, it says two things. Yahweh spoke to Moses and the angel of the Lord spoke to Moses. Mm -hmm. So the angel of the Lord is Yahweh mm -hmm. and Yahweh is the angel of the Lord, right? So, But somehow this, this angel of the Lord is also a human form. So this is how we get the pre-incarnate uh, Christ is, is the angel. So there's something there um, that drives people to believe that the angel of the Lord, this commander of the Lord's army, is God because it ex he accepts worship, mm -hmm. right? His feet, uh, you have to take off your sandals because you're on holy ground when you're by him. So that's really important because uh, everything else is idolatry. If you're not worshiping God, it's idolatry. Yeah. So Joshua, Which is why you see, for example, in the prophets, they, if they fall down right. at the feet of an angel that's not the angel of the Lord, the angel says, stand up. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, Revelation 19 and Revelation 22. I think Revelation 19, verse 9 and 10, and Revelation 22, verse 8, those two, he goes, don't you know, don't worship me, yeah. right? We're fellow servants. Yeah. I'm your fellow servant with you We're in Christ, which is really interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's interesting to think about that their angels are fellow servants, mm -hmm. fellow church members, if you think about it that way. Besides that, um, yeah, so that's that. So that's how we get this idea of the pre-incarnate Christ figure, is that as being the angel of the Lord. Anyways, Corey, yeah. I think that that's it. I think we settled that question. Let's I just, think so too. Let's just move on. All right. This is uh, regarding Joshua 6. It's a viewer question. And it, and it asks, uh, or, or asks, is there any archaeological evidence of Jericho? Yeah, definitely. So um, Jericho is one of the oldest cities uh, um, on earth that has been excavated, that, that is known about. So it's, it's definitely been identified uh, and very famously, famously excavated in several seasons, starting in the early 1900s. Uh, I mean, the, the, the most famous excavation is probably still the 1950s excavation of Kathleen Kenyon. So I think she ex excavated from 50 to 58, uh, something like that. And it's one of the most famous because she claimed that there was um, 
that there was no evidence that pointed to the biblical account of the taking of Jericho by Israel, uh, because there's, I mean, there is mass, there's evidence of a mass destruction of the city of Jericho. The issue is on the dating of that destruction. So when did it fall? Because the, there is a, a really interesting amount of evidence that shows the walls falling, uh, whether that be by earthquake, uh, we, I mean, which is probably likely, it probably is an earthquake. That is, uh, I think, what we should see as happening. Um, that that toppled the walls. It toppled the top wall um, uh, of the city, and pu- and the 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 stones of the top wall, the mud bricks of the top wall, fell down onto the smoothed surface. That uh, it, the 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 word for that is escaping me right now. Uh, and then and the bottom wall also fell, effectively creating a ramp for the invaders to come in, which is what we read about in Joshua, right? So so what uh, what became then the the popular theory of archaeologists that is still held by many archaeologists today is that the biblical author had accurate information about the fall of Jericho, but attributed it falsely to the Israelites and made up the account of Joshua. Um, after the fact, to explain the destruction of Jericho. Because Kathleen Kenyon said the destruction of Jericho, I believe, happened too early. Was it too early or too late to be the destruction of Joshua? But the there has been a lot of other work done on the site of uh, Jericho, uh, most famously done by uh, Dr. Bryant Wood, who's an expert in ancient pottery. He works for the Associates for Biblical Research, which is BibleArchaeology.org, is their website. Great articles on there. There was a really famous, I think, Time Magazine article that was published uh, that Bryant Wood was published in examining the excavations of Kathleen Kenyon, whom, if memory serves me right, it's been a long time since I've gone down that, that rabbit hole and 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 follow the trail along but if memory serves me right one of the main issues is that Kathleen Kenyon dated the destruction of Jericho based off of the absence of a certain kind of pottery uh, from that that is known to date to the time of the conquest but the problem is she only excavated in in very small pits around uh, around the city that wouldn't necessarily contain the type of pottery that she was using to date. Uh, and turns out there was that kind of pottery found in uh, earlier excavations and later excavations. Uh, and Bryant Wood has done some really interesting research on redating the fall of Jericho. And really interestingly, like when you when you go and you look pretty famously, there is one section of the of the wall of ancient Jericho that did not fall. Only one section that did not fall, and there's houses attached to that section of the wall, which of course makes us think biblically of Rahab whose house was attached to the wall and did not fall because she protected the spies of Israel and essentially converted to the Israelite religion and worship of Yahweh and then was integrated into Israel. So lots of interesting things. If you want to like have the actual rundown of what's going on and dig into the research, I would really recommend going to Associates for Biblical Research. Their website is biblearchaeology.org and take a look at their Jericho articles. You can go down a really interesting rabbit trail. Did so they find the scarlet thread? That was cool. <laughs> yeah. Wow, yeah, that would be something. <laughs> be amazing, right? For it to even survive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, right, Corey, that's a good answer. I have another question for you. Sure. You know, maybe I should just keep doing this and you just keep answering. Mm, I don't know about okay, that. So Joshua 7, it's just one chapter at a time. Joshua like, 7. Joshua 7. Uh, Why did God judge the sin of Achan so harshly? Mm-hmm. Okay, so Joshua 7. Yeah. And Joshua 7 is coming off of the high of Joshua 6, right? So yes. Israel actually is able to, to overtake Jericho, which was this huge, fortified, established city. And, and, and oh man, the walking, the seven days walking around the city of Jericho uh, is potentially reminiscent of the creation, right? So it's this uncreation of Jericho, which is just such an interesting thing to think about. But then we get to um, I, and we see Israel being 
defeated right away. And so th this answering this question, my answer to this question is going to bring up more questions. I I understand that. And the show will be longer. This is this is good thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we see yeah. we see that Israel is supposed to be this holy nation. Right. This this nation bringing in the presence of God and judging right. the evil of the Canaanites, of what's going on. That's just a fact of the conquest. It's an uncomfortable fact for several reasons, uh, historically. But when there was this idea of devoted things, there was this idea of things that were devoted to destruction, meaning devoted to God. So they were not allowed, there were certain, certain cities that they were allowed to keep spoils of war from, and there was other cities where they were not at all allowed, right? And so we're told right away in Joshua chapter seven, it says, uh, seven verse one, but the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things for Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. So we see a few things going on here. We have Achan directly rebelling against a command of God pretty much instantly, right? He, he doesn't think that God will punish him for this. He doesn't think that God sees. He doesn't think that God essentially is real. This tells us a few really interesting things. First, that the miracles that were going on, even the destruction of Jericho, could be written off by people who didn't want to believe, which is probably why we should envision it as a divine earthquake, right? Because Achan is somehow able to say to himself, God doesn't see. God's not going to punish me for this. I can totally get away with it. I can hide this. No big deal, right? Um, but it also highlights for us that Israel was on this mission uh, and, and, and it was a mission of judgment. And if they participated in that culture that they were bringing judgment against in any way, they too became like that culture and devoted to destruction. Not good. It also tells us that Israel was treated as a group rather than individually. Notice how all of Israel suffered because of the sin of Achan, of one man, lived together, died together within this structure. But then Achan and his family were, were punished specifically for this sin. And, and it, it highlights for Israel the absolute necessity of following the instructions of God. It highlights the reality of God uh, and, it, and it highlights this responsibility that they had to be different, to be holy, to follow God. Right. So that's yeah. what I would say. Do you have anything that you want to add? No, I, I think that's good, yeah, because he, he, he took here uh, for himself uh, a beautiful cloak from Shinar, mm -hmm. 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. Yep. So he just took money. Spoil. Spoil, yeah, spoil. Spoil. Um, so it's not inherently explicit idolatry. It's not taking idols, let's say. Um, yeah, but, depending but, on what the cloak was, yeah. Right, but it seems like, yeah, that's a good point. But it seems like, though, he is prioritizing himself. So you can say self-idolatry, you can say self-worship. People can try to create that case. Um, at the same time, it's like you've completely rejected everything God has done for you and what God has said specifically at that moment. Mm -hmm. You've completely prioritized yourself at the jeopardy of others. Mm -hmm. And that's another pattern someone has to keep in mind here. He's not just doing it. He's not like stealing something is, you know, it's not going to hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, every time someone does something it through, so far historically for the Israelites, it affects everybody else. Yeah. Like deeply. So whenever someone sins against God, everyone else is hurt. So he's, and so this is something you have to ignore. Yeah. So he's ignoring a whole bunch of things here. Yes. So whether or not he's ignoring God's existence, yeah, or whether or not he's ignoring simply, you know, God's, you know, uh, power, yeah, whatever. So he's ignoring something, um, 
and he clearly he says, I've sinned against the Lord. He tells everyone where it is. Yeah. Right? And he, he says, like, I coveted it. I, I was jealous for it and I took it. Yes. So his sin overran his fear of the Lord. His right. his desire for his sin was greater right. than his fear and of God. So in this circumstance, he was worthy of the punishment, was capital punishment. Yeah. Right. But, so, and, and I think, like, speaking of ignoring things, because you were talking about ignoring things, I think this is something that we ignore when we're talking about the conquest, because a big issue that comes up when we're looking at the conquest is people claim that this was like some sort of race war, that this was some sort of ethnic oh, right. cleansing on the part of Israel. But we see here within Israel and 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 how God deals with this as well. I think this event of Achan brings up that it was about sin. That, um, you know, Achan being an Israelite, being from the tribe of Judah, from which all the kings of Jerusalem would come, yeah. this celebrated tribe of leadership, that fact, his genealogy did not save him from the punishment of sin. Right. Right? So the issue here is sin. It is sin that makes us worthy of destruction, not who our parents were or where we were born. Right? It's it's our sin, and, and that is really highlighted here in the very beginning of the conquest. Yeah. No, I think you're right. Yeah, I think and people who are say all that race stuff, I don't know, it just... Super yeah, soft. but it, it is because it, <laughs> but it's because it, it's it's ignoring what the text is claiming, yes, right? It's ignoring exactly right. it's ignoring yeah. what the text is actually saying. But this is another one of those things. Yeah, it's a good example that yeah. you know brings that to the forefront. Yeah. we see right away that it's about sin. It's not about it's yeah. not about your your race or your yeah, culture. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And, and this, it's interesting that they didn't take spoils of wars or certain things too, because even in like. Um, let's take the Vikings, okay? It's not even necessarily about race, but they would go everywhere and they built a whole economy on, on plunder and spoils. Yes. Right? And, and, and you have to. You have to. You have to so because fact, war is so expensive. Exactly. So the fact that they, they had to devote the plunder to destruction in some places mm -hmm. is telling. About it was the a sacrifice. Of the war. Yeah, it was right. a sacrifice because it, it's it's a lose lose situation. That's right. Right, because not only are we expending all of this the, this capital, human life and money and food and 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 um, resources, in general, resources yeah. everything. Yeah. Um, but then you're not getting anything in return. That's right. Yeah. So you're just spending, spending, spending. Yeah, yeah it's true. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Right. Let's okay. Let's do it. Let's Matlock. Yes. Joshua 10. Yes. Okay. Are you ready for it? <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, Joshua 10 is the famous miracle of the sun standing still. Yeah. Or did it? Because this question for you, Matlock, is what really happened when the sun yeah. stood still? Everything's poetic. Nothing's real. Anyways, no. <laughs> <laughs> Your answer is nothing <laughs> happened? Is that... Yeah, anyways. Joshua so waxed let's just lyrical? Read. Is that your let's answer? Let's just read... Uh, Verses 12 to 14 and on. Okay? Sure. All right. So at the time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when and the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, sun stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nations took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? The sun stopped in the midst of the heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of man for the Lord fought for Israel. All right. So there's a couple explanations for some people how to justify this. One, you know, there's the, uh, uh, some people try to give a scientific analysis about how this could work with, you know, you know, you stop, the, the earth has to stop rotating. Everything has to stop. Oh my gosh. Right. And so, so many issues. Yeah. There's, there's so, to make this possibly work from a scientist, scientific perspective, there's just a lot happening. There's a lot of wheels turning, right, to make it work. The other uh, option is the local view, which is, you know how it was dark in Goshen? I uh, saw it was dark in Egypt, but it was light in Goshen kind mm -hmm. of thing. Okay. Something like that, where somehow this is a local miraculous event that, right. that, it was perceived to be this case, but it wasn't actually the case. Okay. Either way, it's still a crazy miracle. But um, I've also heard that 
it, I, I've also heard the theory that nothing actually physically happened. It's just that God allowed such great victory right. for Israel that it was as if the day was super long because it should have taken a lot longer to defeat the armies that they actually defeated. Oh, okay, it was just like a <laughs> metaphorical day. So it's like human perspective. Right. He made the day long, like in terms of a, a figure of speech, he made us very victorious. Okay. So, Exceptionally so. Right. And unusually so. I've, I've heard that as well. Okay, so in that case, right. So it's the, where it's a figure of speech. Um, they go in, they wipe the floor at them within a day. Uh, right? So it's like, okay. And this is how they express it in their Just ancient fast, culture. fast, fast. It was like... And so when you read that... Outrageously fast. Right. Shouldn't have happened kind of fast. Right. I'm and not the saying that that's the theory that I the go with. I'm just saying that's what I've Until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Okay. So either way. So here's yeah. what I'm trying to say. Regardless of the view you take in this position. Okay. So there's several different options on the table. There's three options on the table. I think the local view, kind of difficult to justify how that works. I don't understand how that works visually, if I'm being honest. Um, uh, so as let's say it's between the scientific view and just the figure of speech view, okay? As your as your primary, so your strongest options, let's say, on the table. Um, uh, the scientific one, which is which is very, uh, which is like I said, a lot of wheels are turning to explain. The which um, is understandable because it's like not only is the, does the Earth have to stop rotating, right? Mm -hmm. The sun, which is perceived to go around like this, right? Okay, the, we, uh, the moon itself has to stop rotating. Everything has to stand still completely, which is completely capable. God can completely do this. So it's in God's wheelhouse to be able to do this uh, miracle. So it's not like, and if people are like, well, wouldn't that make like, it would shake the earth and like there'd be earthquakes everywhere if everything stopped. It's okay, well, of course God can stop. Like, that's not a problem. Like God can, God can, uh, mitigate the he knows what's going to happen if he does this right and he can mitigate those compensations so god can do this it's in his wheelhouse to do this yeah um, of course it is the question is whether or not is this something that god would do just for a battle's sake and that's the question and that is above my pay grade i think that just me personally i lean towards that it happened physically mm -hmm. happened mm -hmm. um the the figure of speech option is interesting because there are certainly cases of historic man speaking that way, mm -hmm. where they just say, hey, this it doesn't seem like what the text is saying. The team the text seems to be indicating a miracle. Um, but the figure of speech option is interesting in the sense that man does speak in on these poetic terms. Yeah. Often, I, but the question is how do we justify can we justify that all the time? It's like, well, no, we can't. There's certain instances where we can't for Hezekiah uh with with the sundial yep, going, going backwards, backwards. right? Uh, he goes, Lord, if you're real, if you're going to answer my prayer, have the sundial go backwards. And it does. That's not poetic. Like, there's no way to, to justify that poetically. It is. Otherwise, <laughs> his prayer is mute. Like, it doesn't happen. He can't just say, oh, oh, he poetically did. It's like, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. uh, Hezekiah's prayer is not answered. So I don't think that you can make a strong case in this instance for the figure of speech. Well, so I, I think, think also I, we, we right. often ignore that, like in the poetic section, it also says the moon stopped. No, I know. Right? So everything Like as the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Right. So, I mean... Like, no, I, yeah, I could hear what they're saying in the sense that ancient man does speak in this way. Mm. Right? It's like, it was a fast and speedy battle where it's like what should have been a whole day. But it's again, you have, here's the qualifying word. Here's the reason why I don't think it's complete. Um, there has not been a day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of man for the Lord fought for Israel. But even that, it's not, it doesn't say there no, has been no indicated. day like it before or since when God stopped the sun. I know. No, right? I know. It I says when the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. So I'm just yeah. saying there is a case there that can no, be made. I agree that there's a case. But something happened. Something miraculous happened. And it's impossible for us to go back and be like, this is exactly what happened, scientifically or not scientifically. I don't think that's the... Well, I don't think that's a really healthy way of looking at miracles. I, yeah, I know personally, exactly. yeah. well, personally, trying, but like I, but something happened. I think something happened that was miraculous enough that either it looked like the sun stood still, or the sun right. actually stood still, 
or the battle was miraculously won in a in a in a in a wild amount of time, or it felt as if the day was something happened where everyone went, well, "Wow, this is God fighting for Israel, and this is amazing." Right. So, yeah, because I hear. So, for instance, okay, so that's as take, if like Josh was commanding. So, if you, the scientific view, sun stands still at Gibeon, right? That's a specific location, yep. right? And moon in the Valley of Agilon. So, those are specific locations mm -hmm. for which they'd have to. Uh, not move essentially. Yep. Now, if the battle happened in a whirlwind, let's say hypothetically time stopped. Sure. In this area. Okay. So let's throw another one out there. <laughs> oh my let's just throw, let's throw another one out there. Okay? It's just like so yeah. pointless. I know. I know. I'm just throwing. I know. I, I, okay. Yeah. I, you don't have to try to explain it. What okay. really happened? Okay. okay. Something happened. I'll, I'll go with you. A miracle happened of some uh -huh. kind. I'm just throwing something else out there. So let's say there's a time slowed down everywhere else but just here. Did it? That's. Honestly, at this rate, equally as likely as the Earth stopping rotating and everything else. Like honestly, in my head, it's like, sure. why not at this point? Like, you can, you can, you can justify <laughs> anything from the scientific perspective. Like, okay, well, this just had to have happened, right? Okay. Well, anyways, so so let's say that's the case. Okay. So the the, the actual sun and the actual moon does actually stop there. All right. It's still. The figure of speech model still prevails in the sense that it, uh, in the, if the time did stop, because even from a scientific perspective, right, you would, uh, nothing rotated, nothing changed, like no one else is affected. Only that battle itself in that specific time, right, everything else was sped up essentially to meet, to be happened within a whole day. Right. Right. So it's not like, it was an additional day of time was added on to the actual day itself. See what I'm saying? Now I have heard, just so kind of throw something out there, that uh, someone argue that the, the Earth used to have a, be a 360 day cycle. Yeah. And then this is what caused 365 days. Mm -hmm. They added an extra five days, this. Okay, whatever. I don't know. Again, impossible yeah. to prove. So it's, it's impossible to prove. The scientific angle is impossible to prove. Yeah. There's nothing you can do about it. So at the end of the day, you have to rely on uh, it just being a miracle. And it kind of just being like, okay, well, a miracle happened of some kind. I think most people would probably lean towards the figure of speech model of saying that that makes the most it's sense. It's the cleanest. Because it's the cleanest. It's easier for our Western appetites. <laughs> Yeah. It just is, yeah. Right, just for how for how we think we're less supernaturally we... inclined. That's exactly and right. And more figure of speech inclined for better or for worse doesn't mean we doesn't mean our yeah. culture is right. And it just the means that's the way is, we is generally that, go. Uh, th these these two things should not be mutually exclusive because mm -hmm. it's like there are times when it's a in, in, like I said with Hezekiah, it's an incredible miracle, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't really just you can't justify figure of speech because it needs to be real world correspondence for it. And there are other times where it's like, okay, well, I could see how that makes sense. In terms of figure of speech, yeah. like in this case. Yeah. So, so what I'm saying is, is that like people will be like, you're a heretic for even thinking this could be figure of speech. Yeah, that's a problem. Okay, but it's that, okay. that, that but, attitude's a problem. Well, that's what I'm calm saying. Calm down your cal even, calm your roll down if that's what you're thinking. But if it's potentially justifiable for it to be figure of speech, mm -hmm. then that's on the table. You just don't depend on it as your absolute answer. Yeah, people approach people approach the scripture in such a different it's it's possible for people to approach the scripture in my opinion, from two very different angles and yet both be attempting to honor the scripture and interpret it in a correct way. Like they're both attempting to do that, but they're so vastly different in their worldviews that they're approaching it in such a different way because it, it's entirely possible for someone who is looking at it from a perspective of a figure of speech for example, they're going in there, they're going, okay, what did Joshua actually intend to say to me? And through their studies, they come to the conclusion that Joshua was probably using a figure of speech. And to them, that's the most, like, that's the, the, the best way to interpret the scripture. And someone else is coming at it and going, what do I think that the Bible is saying here? And I think it's saying this. Doesn't mean there's, it does not mean that there isn't a truth that actually happens, right. but we have to be a little bit, a little bit more charitable, I think, when it comes to people who have differing perspectives. Now, it's totally different if their perspective is wildly changing the gospel or if it's not actually attempting to honor the scripture. That is a problem. So I'm not, I'm not um, trying to make a case here for, 
You can interpret the scripture however you want and it doesn't matter. It absolutely does matter, but there's room for discussion on details like this. So, yeah, I know it's translated to English, but here's what I would say is the kicker for why I think the something physically happened, that there's a real world correspondence to this. And I read the wrong verse last time. This is verse 13, at the end of verse 13. The sun stopped in the midst of the heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. Right there. Yes. Is that's the kicker right there. I read. I think so too. So is, is to appeal to the real world correspondence. The sun stopped in the midst of the heaven. Yep. Right location. And also the moon. So you have these two beams of lights, essentially. Something happened and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. I, I actually think that like personally, if I'm yeah. going personally, I, I think the the Bible is very clear that something physical actually did happen. Right. Like I think that makes the most sense yeah, of I the think text. So too. And I think especially when you look at the the much more supernatural worldview that existed at this time period, when you look at other records and everything like that, um, I, I think the Israelites who read this originally would have been also on on the, the bandwagon of yeah. something physically happened because God was seen very much so. Like today, we've kind of divorced God from uh, the working of the universe. But back then, an earthquake was caused by God. A famine was caused <sighs> by God. A, and we see this throughout the Old Testament. Yeah. So the fact that Joshua says uh, God fought for Israel, and he did this by making the sun stand still. And the moon, yeah. I think we, I think the natural reading of this text is that something physically happened in nature that was miraculous, and they were like, "See, this is proof of God fighting for Israel." Yeah, uh, because something physically actually so, did happen. So personally, that's where I am at, and I think I think that's the best case. Personally, I think it is the best case. Uh, however, I'm still willing to to have conversation with with people well, who think it's you have to because I'm saying hypothetically, if there's a case to be made, you have yeah. to let the case be made because there's nothing wrong with these things being figures of speech if that's what it's teaching. Yes, and you have to be open to that. Anyways, also, oh, sorry. No, no, no. You're good. I I think that <clears throat> that what I think is really interesting too is if you look at what that means. So the the sun is the greater light, and the moon is the lesser light, and these are both out shining in this because he's asking for light. All the power of light, mm -hmm. right, to, to the nation of Israel is beaming on mm -hmm. their battle so that they could win the war. Mm -hmm. So like, or win the battle, excuse me. And that's really interesting, right? So it's like, it's not just the sun. It's yeah. also the night. It's, it ensures that there is, there will be no night when the moon's out also. And especially because, especially because also the sun and moon were objects of worship. They were objects right. of pagan worship. And so by God using these things to help combat pagan worship, right. that's, that's also another layer of uh, symbolism. And yes. um, I do believe, you should check me on this, but I do believe the name Jericho is, uh, is similar to the word for moon. And so there's something going on there as well in terms of there may have been moon worship involved in Jericho and right. all that good stuff. So there's so, there's layer upon layer of communication going on. And there's a reason why this event specifically was so meaningful to Israel and so meaningful to the Canaanites of that time and was, you know, important enough to record in scripture. So, yeah, I, so there's that whole yeah, thing. I, I, but like, can we just take a minute? Sure. Can we just take a minute and say, for, uh, this is my this is my worldview. This is my perspective. Weird things happen. Weird oh. things happen in the world that cannot be explained, and I think we have to be okay with that. So, like there is a spiritual world, and weird things here's, happen. Here's the local. Here, okay, the, the resurrect the local view idea. So, do you, do you ever remember that time when people in Chicago saw Toronto? And they saw the skyline of Toronto. Of yes. And the reason why they saw the skyline of Toronto and they could tell it was Toronto is because the CN Tower and things were present. They were, oh. Wasn't it some sort of prism effect? With yeah, the people tried to tr explain how this is possible. Okay? Yeah. But here's what I'm trying to say. Is that it is an example of weird things happen in the sky all the <laughs> yeah, time. Yeah. Okay, so suppose, suppose that it wasn't the actual sun that's like, that was in the sky. But suppose it was a light that looked like the sun that was beaming and God sure, allowed it like to the happen. pillar of fire in the wilderness yeah. kind of thing. Yes. And suppose that was it. And suppose that's what God did. And they're like, it's the sun. Speaking of weird things. I don't have a problem with that in principle. Yeah. Now, is God lying to us? Now, anyways, so right. some people jump to God's lying to us. Okay, no, just stop. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Anyways, it's not what's happening here. God's using the light. What I'm saying is, is God created like a reflection of the light, so it looks like the sun beaming, but it's still the light source. Yeah. Anyways, the whole point is that there's so many ways that this could be, that there's like, you, you can kind of like reason this out. The key point to be made is that a miracle happened. How it worked, I don't know specifically. Mm-hmm. I have faith that God knows what he's doing. God did a greater miracle when he created the whole universe. Yeah. So Yeah, pretty much. Right? Pretty so much, it's yes. Like, okay, yes. All right? So, <laughs> okay. Right, when he created consciousness, that's a greater miracle. So, it's like... It, it, I, I love how we're... I, yes. Like, we have to... We, okay. I, I, think it's, I think it's equally... And maybe this is me speaking out of turn. But for me, from my perspective, I think it, it makes me chuckle both ways. When, on the one hand, we're like, oh, God can't do that. Right. He's the maker of the sun and the moon. He can yeah, do whatever so, he wants. Yeah. But on the other hand, then we have to be able to scientifically explain it. I, I know. And I'm like, okay, but he's the maker of heaven and earth. If he is that, that's kind of the ultimate trump card where he can do what he wants. Yeah. Like, does he normally do that? We no. Can expl- oh, but he can do it. There's, yeah, you could try to, ex- here's where it becomes interesting. If this were to be the case, here's the scientific explanation, I mean, it becomes interesting. If it were to be like the actual sun. Yeah. And all the standings, all these things. Yes. What would the what would have to what would God have to like yeah. stop for the that going down I don't the have, checklist yes. is interesting. I but, think that is interesting. I don't right. I don't mean to like make a mockery of no, people whose minds think no, like that. Not, I think that's actually a good thing to follow through that and yes. it can yield interesting results. But right. yeah. Well, you're have not to just, you're on not either just, side. Yeah, you're just not But weird on things. It. There's so many weird things in the Bible, like pillar of fire. Yeah. Water from a rock. All and right. yeah, they all they all play in theologically. Yes. I just mean it's weird. I agree. It's stuff that doesn't normally happen. It's weird. It's totally it's weird. weird. All right, let's move on. <laughs> let's do it. Let's just move on. Corey, <laughs> I'm sorry for my note. I wish I had brought Kleenex on. This is terrible. It's like I've been losing it. We've been passing a cold back and forth with our children in our household for quite a few weeks now. For like now. a month, I'm yeah. Sorry. Brutal. But you guys have to hear our scratchy voices in our... Joshua 14 and 19 this is the, has to do with the allotments. Yes. Why did God preserve the 12 tribes of Israel and their territories if he did not intend to use them in the new covenant? Okay, so this is an old covenant, new covenant question. Right. Uh, okay. I'm not going to be able to like comprehensively answer, I don't think, and go into, because I don't know all of the <laughs> reasons that God has for the 12 tribes. And yeah. I know that's probably not what you're asking. But... What I would say is there is a difference. There is a major difference, uh, several, between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, even though the Old Covenant informs the New Covenant, and the New Covenant in many ways reflects the Old Covenant. So um, let's remember that the covenant that God struck with Abraham was a land-grant covenant, typologically. So. God told Abraham, you and your ancestors, follow me and I will give you a land, a physical land, and I will bless your land and I will grow you in the land. So if then, if I'm your king, then this is going to happen. That was their inheritance. Okay. Now, Theologically speaking, did they expect a later inheritance other than the physical land of Israel? Yes, because the resurrection is a thing, right? And and, and death going into Abraham's bosom and awaiting a physical resurrection is a thing. So I know that that covenant went beyond the physical land of Israel, but it was in a very real sense landlocked in that that was their physical allotment here on earth. The New Testament covenant is not like that. And that's one of the points, is it takes away the land aspect of salvation so that all nations can become children of God. We can become, we can partake in the covenant of Abraham, right? So God doesn't say to me, um, as a Canadian, you know, you follow me and this will forever be your land allotment in Canada. Um, and likewise for wherever you are in the world. Our, our, our covenant is spiritual and physical, but for eternal life, for the new heavens and the new earth. We have an inheritance in heaven with God. We have an inheritance as a son of God. 
uh, which presumably would include some sort of land and, and also our life. So we've got like this, but that's for the world to come, not for the world now. So what we say about the the landlockedness of Israel is is that that does have a lot of uh, spiritual and um, uh, real world input for us. In that it's it, much of it is a shadow of the new covenant, like it, it points to the new covenant. We see, you know, that Israel had to. Yeah, there is like a physical and a spiritual element just as as there is now. I'm kind of spiraling. No, I know what you're saying. Do you, do you know what I'm trying to say? Do you know what I'm yeah. trying to point out? I'm not sure if I'm just completely not doing it justice. Yeah, it's okay. It's kind of a weird question well. because it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like a nihilistic question. It's like, well, what's the point of this whole thing? Right. Yeah, so it kind of dismisses <laughs> it. So uh, in one hand, it's okay. So when you look at, like, remember it says the, you're talking about the shadows of things to come. So the old covenant is a shadow of the new covenant, which we, in the, the new covenant, it's the substance. The, the substance is Christ. So whenever you have um, the old covenant stuff happening, like the Passover or mm -hmm. whatever, these are types or these are pictures that point to a reality. They're signs. It is not the substance. And that's what's really important. So, for instance, when people say, okay, why were there Jesus to choose 12? Oh, because the choose 12 disciples. Oh, because the 12 uh, 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 tribes, right? You can also look at it the other way around. The 12 tribes were chosen because of uh, God chose 12 disciples. Mm -hmm. Because God, that's what it's, it's all going towards there. So the anchor, the thing that, so the thing that defines everything is the new covenant. It, the new covenant defines the old covenant. So it's like the old covenant is building up to that. It's just historically moving towards that. But it's the new covenant that has the, all the substance and all the weight. So it's what defines the, the other one. It's what makes it worthwhile. It's what they were all waiting for in the old covenant. So I think you can use the new covenant as kind of like an anchor to yeah. kind of navigate how you look at like things that happen in the old covenant. So um, if Christ... Go ahead. No, keep going. So Okay. So yeah, so just an error is... Um, uh, Jesus, right? The Jacob's twelve sons are paralleled. Uh, so, what did I say? Jesus' twelve sons. Jesus' twelve disciples. <laughs> uh, yes. Whoa, whoa, whoa! That's right. a whole different show. That That's is, a whole different yeah. uh, conspiracy uh, theory. <laughs> Jacob and his twelve sons. Man, yes. we're just off today. Jacob's twelve sons, right, are a parallel for the disciples. Je the yeah. disciples, exactly. And that's the kind of the thing that. that has yeah, to it's happen. found. It's foundational, right? Because then we see in Revelation. Uh, the the walls of Jerusalem founded on the twelve apostles, right. like hearkening back to the twelve tribes, and yes, yeah, growing from and growing out of. Yes, and I think that this twelve there is important, uh, just for there's numerological uh, significance. I'm sure, yeah, right. Which I'm not necessarily. I have never studied, but I'm sure that there is. Absolutely, right. Yeah. Um, even the fact that man is uh, is cut in half is six and six, two men, and the and the the thirteenth. Is Christ and right? So it's who's seven, uh, and it's like you have like man and man all like, uh, flanked right with Christ in the middle. Anyways, so uh, there's just significance there. You know what? So, I, what, what I also think is really interesting about the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, and how Israel was supposed to run uh, as a physical land was that. So we have this paradise lost, right, in Genesis, the beginning of Genesis. So we've got Adam and Eve working in the garden. So even before sin, even before the fall, there's work. But it's not work that also has stress associated with it because it's not work for survival, right? Because in the garden, they they still had to work the garden and tend the garden and spread the garden and keep evil from the garden. It's still work. They're busy. But it's without that added element of toil and stress where their crops, you know, after Adam and Eve fall, we see uh, God telling Adam, "Well, now you're going to have stress associated. With this you're going to it's going to be the sweat of your brow. This like and and uh, people have done word studies on this where it's not sweat sweat as in hard work like you've gone for a run. It's it's sweat as in like I'm scared. I I'm I have got my fight or flight activated because I'm not sure if all of this work that I've put in is actually going to feed my family or if there's going to be a drought and we're all going to die." 
So there's this stress element and toil and, and fear that's now involved in providing, providing food for ourselves. And I think what's really interesting about the Abrahamic covenant is that when you go through and then you look at the, the Mosaic covenant that God, uh, you know, struck with Moses on Mount Sinai is that there's this blessing on the land of Israel that if if and when the Israelites are fulfilling their covenant with God, that they're going to be working, but God is going to be blessing them with so much abundance that you get this almost Garden of Eden vibe where there's an assurance that their crops are going to yield multiples back to them so that it removes that toil, that fear element out of their work for them. Uh, and of course, this doesn't happen because uh, because of the, sin, the sins of Israel uh, that you read about, but I think that's interesting in terms of the new covenant where um, we've got that, we, you know, the end of God's redemptive plan is essentially the new creation, this new Eden, this new heaven and earth where God's presence is again with mankind. And we have this assurance of eternal life without that toil and stress. It's the reversal. So in that way, there is a huge parallel between the physical land of Israel and the, and the 12 tribes of Israel and what God's ultimate redemption plan is. I just thought right. that was kind of fun to bring up. No, that's good. Another thing well. I was thinking, I'll just add to this. Yeah. Is do you remember when Paul says, I was looking for it, I didn't find it yet. I was trying to remember where it was. I thought it was Galatians. Paul says, um, the law is a guardian. Yes. Okay. So in a similar way that the territorial divides and all these things were a guardian. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and not, not only a type of uh, physical guardian so that the, the Messiah might come about it, but also like a typological guardian. Now, um, I think that, and I'm not going to go too much deep into, deeper into this, because I don't think I actually have a full answer to this question. I feel like there's something else here, which is really unfortunate. There's something else here that I need to dig into. But I think this is the nature of this question, if it is coming from like a nihilistic place. Um, this is like this, what's the point? Like, like what's the point of doing this? If God just doesn't plan to use it anyways. You can make that same case with virtually everything. Like, what's the point of having us live on earth if, you know, we could just be in heaven? Like, what's the point of uh, having us go through these experiences? Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the point of suffering if, uh, you know, if it's, if there's just, it's, it's useless. It's kind of like a self-eating thing. It's like, well, God is using how humans operate to accomplish his will. So if, if, if it's creating uh, land allotments based on the patriarchs of your family is what the society is doing, then God's going to use that. You see what I'm saying? God's going to use that for his own, um, to accomplish his will, essentially. And so I think that, uh, I think there's, there's, I don't really have a full answer to this, uh, to this question. But, and so I think it'd be good to hear what people think about this, what other people think to comment yeah, below. Yeah, definitely. Um, but I do I think it has to do with the guardian, with being the guardian, both typologically and physical guardian of the territories. Anyways. All right. That's my cheap answer. Shall we move on? Let's just move on. Let's do it. Let's move on. Last question. Uh, let's do For it. For you, Matlock. Um, I don't know how to say this. Nam Pumelelo. Oh, right. Yeah, that's pretty good. It's the person who... The, the name of maybe Nigerian? The, I don't know. Maybe. I'm sorry. Yeah. I can't I can't pronounce that very right, well. Right. But okay. it says, Good day, my good teachers. I believe all is well with you. I have a question concerning the Book of Mormon. I was wondering whether uh, you do have a knowledge about the book and how it apparently completes the Bible. That's what I heard. But it will be a great pleasure to know and understand about the adding and removing of scriptures in the Bible. I want to know what uh, I want to know that what does the Book of Mormon add in the Bible? Okay, so um, I don't think the Book of Ad Mormon adds anything to the Bible. I think it actually detracts and takes away from the Bible, personally, because very clear, off the cuff, Mormonism is not Christian. It's not even a denomination. It's out, It's an outskirts. It's its own thing. It's yeah. its own thing. It's just its own belief. There's a whole bunch of reasons why. One of those reasons you can always tell is when Jesus is not God. Um, so you could hold to, oh, Jesus is a good person, all these different things. But it very specifically teaches that Jesus is a creature, the first of all creatures, and that Satan is his brother. 
And so, I don't know much about the ins and outs of Mormonism. Right. I like I don't know enough to I I I wouldn't be like your conclusive source for no, Mormonism. Neither would I. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but there are people who who do do that who know it quite well and and go through it. Yes. But continue. No, that's it. I was going to say that here's just don't trust the Book of Mormon and like written by Joseph Smith. I just just. I, I'm not your definitive source, and I wish I could be more helpful in this regard. Mm -hmm. But it does teach that Jesus is not God, that he's just a creature. When I'm just going to read you one line, right? And we talk, like, honestly, so many times this year, we've already engaged the question mm -hmm. if Jesus is God. Here's this one, Romans 9, verse 5, uh, talking about Israel. To them belong the, the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Jesus Christ is God overall. Mm -hmm. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Right there, it says right there, this, it's so dis, it's unambiguous. Yeah. It's very, Paul says it very plainly. Jesus Christ is God overall. Okay? Yep. So, anyways. And there are many times in the New Testament where we are warned against receiving a different gospel. Yes. So if someone comes to you, even an angel comes to you, and preaches to you a different gospel. It changes the gospel message of Jesus Christ that you received through the New Testament. Don't believe them. That's right. And and um, again, even, even just having, I just have such a problem with this concept that, that for thousands of years, God allowed uh, his, his church to not believe in the true gospel. And then now all of a sudden, thousands of years later, we have someone come along that's going to fix it all. We should be very suspicious very suspicious of those motives um, and look into the history of Mormonism. I would encourage you to look into the history of it and see, you know, some of the, some of the, uh, some of the things that aren't, aren't widely spoken of because right. there's, there's a lot of issues with the found, founding of Mormonism itself. Um, not saying anything against it, but the kindness and and the loveliness of of Mormon people, uh, because in my experience they are very very kind and right. very lovely and very family oriented. But that doesn't mean that they're right about the Bible. It doesn't mean they're right about God. It doesn't mean that they're right about the history of Christianity. So you got to be really careful. That's right. Yeah. And yet, that's all I have to say. I think it's fundamentally wrong mm -hmm. on, it, where, on its position on Christ. Um, and, and once again, it's kind of like an angel. Jesus is an angel, basically, again. They wouldn't say that. That's the thing. So I think a lot of their doctors would have it. Jesus is God, but he's not like God, God. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, that would be that. That would be my, yeah, so just, I, I, who is who's someone we could, maybe um, Mike Winger? Does he do a video on Mormonism? He might. I know he does on Jehovah Witnesses. Mm -hmm. I don't know about Mormonism. He might. Alan Parr, I think, does someone on Mormonism. Okay. I think. So look at those guys. They're big YouTube guys. You can find them there. I think they have uh, more further studies on this. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. those two, unfortunately, I don't have any other recommendations. Those two guys are usually pretty solid for their apologetic work against cults and stuff like that. Yeah. And, yeah. and like uh, encouragement, if you have uh, Mormons who are friends who are talking to about God, don't be afraid to talk to them about God, but always always go back to the Bible, study the Bible, make sure that you know what it is that you're talking about. And then that way you can distinguish between what they're saying and then what the scripture is actually saying. And this is one of the best ways to learn is actually in, in conversation with actual people who believe this stuff, <laughs> you know, have, have conversations with them about, about what they believe and what their church teaches. And then, um, and then compare it with what you read in the New Testament, what you see in uh, the plain black and white there. Yeah. Anything else to add? I hope not. <laughs> I, need, I need to be done. Okay. Uh, yes. We're, we're yeah. going to be done. Going to go get some food. Yes. Maybe have some tea or coffee or something. something. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Let us know what you guys think about all these things that we discussed today. Uh, comments, questions down below. And until next week, happy reading and happy studying. Thank you so much for watching. We want to keep producing high quality biblical content, but we can't do it without your support. If you feel called to support us, please click the link in the description under donate. Your support really means a lot to us.